It's a Man Crush Monday. Join Professor Buzzkill as he crushes on men from history who deserve more fame and glory. We're going back all the way to the 18th century for this episode of Man Crush Monday. Members of the Society of Friends, better known as Quakers, are usually considered very thoughtful people. Their religious services, simply called meetings, are modest and quiet compared to those of other Christian denominations. This modesty and emphasis on quiet is important because one of their central principles is for church members to, quote, listen for the Spirit, even if it is expressed in ways unfamiliar to you. If we can replace unconventional for unfamiliar in this Quaker advice, there could hardly be a more unconventional person than Benjamin Lay. Born in England in 1681, Lay grew up a devout Quaker. He worked as a glove maker, a farmhand, and took to the sea while still a young man. Lay witnessed the effects of slavery and the slave trade for the first time while working in Barbados. Like many Quakers, but not all, he had grown up in an anti-slavery family, and an incident in Barbados caused him to start speaking out against it. He saw a slave kill himself rather than be struck again by his master. Lay speaking out against slavery and the fervor with which he did so made him unpopular with much of the white population in Barbados and even among fellow Quakers. You see, some Quakers were slave traders and had gotten very rich through it. Although the Quakers as a whole were divided over slavery on moral grounds, they didn't denounce it or denounce the slave trade, especially until 1761. Lay eventually left Barbados and moved to the colony of Pennsylvania in 1731, settling near Abingdon outside Philadelphia. There, he continued to speak out against slavery and expanded his activism by publishing dozens of tracts and pamphlets opposing it. Among other things, he argued that the evil of slavery will have a long-lasting effect on society, even if that slavery was banned right away. And the sooner it was banned, the sooner colonial Americans could get on with dealing with the consequences of its fundamental race discrimination. Lay was among the first to dramatize his opposition to slavery in ways that were bound to get the attention of his fellow Quakers, as well as the attention of wider colonial society at the time. In the winter, for instance, he would wear hardly anything and would go shoeless to show how slaves were dressed in the harshest working conditions, but perhaps his most famous and unconventional protest was in 1738. While addressing a Quaker congregation about the evils of slavery, he finished by reminding his audience that the Bible told them that all people were created equal, and that retribution for enslaving other humans was at hand. He then emphasized the bloody nature of slavery by plunging his sword into his Bible, which he had prepared ahead of time, by hollowing out the pages and placing a container of blood-red juice inside. The blood juice spilled out down his arm, and he flung it on those congregants he knew to be slave owners and slave traders. These stunts and Lay's general appearance made his anti-slavery protests memorable and controversial, and he was kicked out of the Society of Friends in 1738. But he remained on many Quakers' minds, long after his death in 1759, and of course, long after the Quaker renunciation of the slave trade in 1761, some Quaker families kept a portrait of Lay in their homes. Perhaps they did this to remind them to pay attention to the unconventional ways that their religious principles might be conveyed to them. I keep saying unconventional because, you see, Benjamin Lay was a dwarf, a little person who had grown only to four feet tall, and his highly public political action was unconventional enough at a time when most little people stayed at home. But his real pioneering contribution was to boycott those material things he believed had been produced by slave labor or by an economic system that was built, at least partly, on slavery. He became a strict vegetarian, he made his own clothes, and eventually lived in a cave near Abingdon, Pennsylvania. He converted it into a relatively comfortable dwelling, which included a small library, rather than live in a traditional house. Withdrawing from the comforts of society did not mean that he didn't act on what he and a great many other Quakers saw as one of the biggest evils of the 18th century. When informed by a friend in 1758 that the Quakers had finally taken the first steps 
toward banning slavery among their congregations. They, they wouldn't officially or finally renounce it until 1761. Lay replied that his life's work had been accomplished and that he could, quote, die in peace, which he did less than a year later. I, for one, can't imagine more unfamiliar ways in which Quakers heard the anti-slavery message than from Benjamin Lay's life and protests. That they acted on it. That is, that they listened to the spirit long before almost any other group in Britain or colonial America says a lot for agitators like Benjamin Lay. Talk to you next week.